Thank you, Chip and the worship team. Thank you, Mark, for that prayer leading us. If you have a copy of the scriptures, take them and turn to Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> I just need to be on your toes this morning. Matthew chapter 7, we're going to do our best to finish the Sermon on the Mount. So that means we got quite a bit of reading to do. <clears throat> but Jesus is an excellent teacher, and he repetition is the mother of learning. We'll take a look at it in detail. I've been asked to make an announcement for you. We have a business meeting, congregational meeting, for the members of New Alliance Church is it next Sunday? I want to make sure. It's two weeks or two weeks? Two Sundays from now. So those of you that know the calendar, what is that? 25th, on October 25th. Uh, it's just about 10 minutes, you know. I'm not running it, so you know that's true. So it's 10 minutes. <laughs> so, okay. So about 10 minutes to uh, nominate or to um, nominate two people to serve on committees as we're getting ready to follow for the, for the new year. So that's the nominating committee is, is the other one, the budget, just one. Two people to serve, on, I'll get this eventually, two people to serve on the nominating committee. So just mark your calendars for that. If you're a member, into the membership class, jump through the hoops, all of that, then you are welcome to join us for that meeting. Again, 10 minutes, we'll get you out of here. Time for the pot roast and the chicken and all that good stuff. All right? Okay, you should be, now you should have located Matthew chapter 7. There should be a crease in your Bible or about right there anyway. So Matthew chapter 7, we're going to read this together. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Scriptures. Uh, we got quite a bit of verses to read, so please stand with me, though, as we honor God in His Word. This is a part of our worship. We're just honoring him. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to pick up where we left off last time. That's verse 12. And the scripture says, and this is Jesus speaking. So whatever you wish others to do, do also for them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide. And the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets. Who come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by the fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears a good fruit, but a diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown in the fire. Thus you'll recognize them by their fruits. And not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, do we not, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? We cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to, you, to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone who th then, who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell and the winds came, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine 
and does them not. And does not do them, excuse me, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished saying these things, or finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. And will you join with me in a word of prayer? Lord Jesus, we quiet ourselves before you. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you come. That we are aware of your presence. That you fill all of us that are here. Believer and unbeliever, we pray that you would open the ear and the heart of the unbeliever. For the believer, we ask that you open our ears and our hearts to receive what you want us to receive. Lord, I have no idea what goes on in the secret parts of the heart of the people that are here today. You do. I know that my heart is desperately wicked and without you, I have no hope. Without you, I have no, I, I, I have no relationship in which I can learn to train and walk. So I assume it's the same for my brothers and sisters out there. We're all pulled in different directions. Our society seems to be falling apart. There seems to be no one who is um, standing up helping us point the way the only person that can do that is you so we need your help Lord this is a safe haven for us to come in and open the scriptures and to hear singing and sing to your wonderful name and reinforce the truth of our lives that we can trust you and so Lord help us now as we look at your word, to learn to trust you, to obey you, to follow you, to count the cost of being a disciple. Lord, I pray for myself. Speak through me. Use this human body. Use this mind to communicate to these brothers and sisters wherever they are your truth to them today. And let us all walk away encouraged, grateful, humble, and resting in your peace. And I pray all these things in your name. Jesus, all God's children says, I had this, uh, like Chip was talking about, I kind of had a little frustration over the last couple of weeks and had a, had something to to do um, as I explained last week there was the tires two tires blown out on the car as we were coming <laughs> coming into Logan's Fort but you know it's just it's just one of those things you just sit there and you go oh, okay all things work together for good and there are people that help with that and this last week I, know, I think I shared with you how uh, my vision had been giving me trouble kind of have this double vision thing going on so I'm I'm reading with one eye closed and I'm kind of getting used to it it's okay I kind of thought about getting an eye patch kind of like Rooster Cogburn and you know put some bling on it or something maybe the Lions logo maybe I could get Shelly to put a you know eye patch you know I'll go on there 
<clears throat> that looked a little bit weird, you know, right on the iPad still as I'm looking out to you. But I had to go to the optometrist. And that's not my first time to the optometrist, obviously. I wear glasses. And as I went in and, and, and sit down, and um, the doctor started asking me questions. And, of course, you fill out a form before you go in. And it was kind of weird because I was doing it with one eye. And it kinda, you're kind of, you know, you think you're putting something here when you're putting something over here. And so I have this double vision thing. And it, was, it was weird because I'd never had this particular test. Maybe some of you have had this test in the optometrist's office. So I was doing this th thing far away, and they do, the, you know, they do the lenses, and they say, is that clear? Is that not clear? Or what's that? You know, and they do that back and forth, which is kind of a little bit annoying, I guess. But, you know, you just keep trying to figure out how to see. Well, there was one test, you know, they do the peripheral test and all of that, see if you've got peripheral vision. They look at your eyes, your, your, you know, the back of your eye and see if, okay, do you have any cataracts or anything going on there? No, nothing's going on there. But I told him when I went in, I said, look, I just see double. <laughs> and I said, when I'm reading or something, I, I can't, I can't focus. And so they did this test, and what they did was they took two frames with a letter in between it. Have you ever had this? And then they keep moving the glasses a certain way until they line up on top of each other. And you can see one image. It's kind of cool. And the doctor told me, he says, you know, here's your problem. We're going to have to put a prism in your glasses. Now, I never even heard of that that was even possible up to this particular point. So they, they said, okay, we're going to put a prism in here, and then you're going to, you know, whether you've got 90 days to wear these and determine whether or not they're going to work for you or whatever. And he says, but I think that's what's going to work. He says, you know, your eyes have gotten a little worse over the time since your last checkup, and we're going to have to give you a little stronger prescription on some other stuff. And my reading is already as high as it can get. So he said, well, the prism's going to help with that because you can see stuff a little bit closer. The, po the point is, is that they had to, had to understand the problem that I have, and then that test, they move a frame these frames that you're seeing projected on the wall, they keep changing the lenses until the frames line up, and then they even come down like that. The purpose of all of this was that I was to see better. I need to improve my vision. Let me suggest to you that that's exactly what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount. He's adjusting our vision. He's calling us to be disciples but here's the problem. Our, our lives are out of focus. And the reason our lives are out of focus is because we are not trained to live as a disciple in the reality of who Jesus is. And I want to submit to you that the largest, se this largest section of people in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, the Jews that Jesus came to, the nation of Israel that he is coming to, did not understand. They, okay, let me say it this way. They were the best prepared theologically. They had healthy eyes. They were the best prepared theologically. However, they didn't know how to see. They had, because their vision was out of focus, they could not see the real intent for Jesus coming. And they started thinking about earthly kingdoms and that sort of stuff. And then they had people, their physician at the time were people who didn't really know how to correct their vision. Jesus comes to correct their vision. Now, that's what he's doing with us. So when we get to this passage, we get to the Sermon on the Mount, which we spend a lot of time on, and we should. Because what we are trying to do is learn to walk. The largest group of people outside Israel, if you want to bring it to today, the largest group of people 
that are non-discipleship, non-disciples to Jesus are in the evangelical church. I want to say that again. The largest group of people who are professing believers but not disciples are in the evangelical church. There are some studies, and I, we did this around Easter, there are some studies that say that over 80% of Americans profess to be Christians. Folks, go, church, go, go plant a church sometime. You'll find out real quick. That's not true. But they profess. Profession is not possession. Okay? Keep that in mind as we go through this. So as we look at Jesus, I started thinking about this whole idea that, this, that, that non-discipleship is a part of the, the evangelical church in America. And I started, you know, and Je Jeff brought up some, some things a while ago that, that it's amazing how the Holy Spirit works because I had thought about talking about this and about persecution. Folks, we're, we're on the verge of this. I, I don't know if you realize, but this whole COVID thing is conditioning us. You need to understand that. And in some states, it's a lot worse what they're doing to us. But just so you know, it's coming. If you back up a few years to the 30, late 30s, the early 40s, the largest or the most advanced country on the face of the earth was Germany. All of the modern scholarly stuff was coming out of Germany and um, there was a little funny looking man from Austria. Funny looking mustache. And he came to power with the sole purpose of bringing Germany back to his glory. And in the process, over six million Jews were exterminated. Now, how does that happen? How does it happen that the most advanced nation on the face of the earth, the one that must be enlightened, can kill six million Jews? But within that nation, there was a young pastor by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you haven't read his classic book, there are two books I would recommend. I would recommend that we do at the church, two books. One is The Cost of Discipleship. That's one. And you're going you're gonna to have to take your time with The Cost of Discipleship because Bonhoeffer is an intellectual and he's going to use some words. You're going to go, what did he just say? What does that mean? And the other is Life Together. A uh, look at Christian community. And Bonhoeffer... Um, was quoted once says this. I want, to, I, want to, I want you to transition now into what we were talking about. We need to get the frames over each other here, and that's what Jesus is doing. But I want you to, under, I want you to think about this. There is a cost involved in following Jesus. And we always focus on the cost. But here's the other side of it. There is a cost to not following Jesus as well. Now, Bonhoeffer said this, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. You see, the point is, the, is simply this. When Jesus starts to put those frames, we understand one frame, we understand one world. When you put those two frames over top of each other, he's taking the other frame, okay? He's saying, this is my way to put it over the top of one another. When you start to put those over the top of the other one, things are going to change in your life. And let me just say, um, and I think this, this is a quote by uh, Paul Washer, something to the effect of this. If your discipleship to Jesus or if your faith in Jesus, one of those two, is not costing you anything, 
then you've probably accepted the American way of salvation. Now, I don't want to be a bummer. I don't want to bum you out. But I want to tell you the truth because that's my job. Now, it's for me as well. What Jesus is looking for is for people who are totally committed to him, that are willing to rearrange their lives around his teachings and choose to make a purposeful decision to train with a master teacher. That's him. It's just like the illustrations that that Paul used, that Jeff brought up in Sunday school, that we train, we stop trying. We take the, the, the theology of the kingdom and we put it into our lives. And what Jesus has been saying in the Sermon on the Mount is that that's the only way you're going to get rid of anger in your life. That's the only way you're going to get rid of cultivated lust in your life. That's the only way you're going to stop manipulating people to get your way. It's the only way that this stuff is going to happen. It's the only way, it's the only path to Christ-likeness. When a, man, when, a, when, a, when a student is fully trained, Jesus said, he will be like his master. Now Jesus is bringing all this together and what he has said to us up to this particular point is that there is a community of love. We have to be committed to love. The two greatest commandments. What's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, those are all components that we'll get into. And what Jesus will get into, the components of our different bodies and our minds and that sort of thing, how our bodies conform to this. But you, you, we start here. When you are saved, you have everything you need to follow Jesus. Frames may be a little bit off right now. Got to move them. Jesus is going to move them over a little bit. He's talking more about walking than he is about the sanctification. I mean, he's talking about sanctification. He's not talking about salvation here. Now, he's saying salvation is free. He's absolutely right. You do nothing to be saved. It is a gift of God. But now there's no condemnation. Sin is, the the pull of sin may still be there because your frames are off. You got to learn to move them over. But listen to the other side of this thing. I am been, I have been given an incredible gift. I can fall. I can walk, I mean, I can walk with him. I can follow him. I have the ability to do it. But for most of the church in America and for most Christians, they've never even stretched to run the marathon. You're not going to go from being, uh, and I don't even know who the big track people are, the people who run marathons and all that kind of stuff. I don't follow that, as you can obviously see. I don't care. I mean, I don't care about that kind of stuff. Ask me about some athlete or something. I might know a little bit about that because there's some, there's some issues there. But some of us have never strapped on the cleats. Do y'all know the name John Wooden? John Wooden was an incredible basketball coach. He's an incredible man. Did you know that when John Wooden, who was a coach at USC... When he would get his recruits and players in the beginning of the year, you know what he talked about when he got them in the room? People might say, well, he would talk about playing offense and defense and how do you, how do you set a trap or here's how you shoot a ball or here's how you hold it or whatever. No, you know what he talked about? How do you put your socks on correctly and so they would go into your shoes and you wouldn't get a blister. That was the first thing he talked about. How to put your socks on correctly. Now, why would he do that? 
it's a foundational principle. See, we have to start there with Jesus. Now, we can go around all day long and say, well, I've been in the church for 40 years. I know how to do this thing. I know how the church is run. Yeah, really? Compare it to the New Testament. And then you might see something a little different. I'm not saying anything we're doing is wrong. I'm just saying we gotta, that's the way we've got to filter it. Now, when Jesus gets started here, there's a series of two responses to his teaching. And I want to look at these quickly. There's a response of a disciple and a response of a non-disciple. Both of them, both illustrations that he will use three times, and he's going to stick some verses there in the middle that are the, some of the scariest verses in Scripture for me. But I think as we go through it, you're going to be able to see um, what he's talking about. So the two responses to Jesus' teaching each way through. So just watch this. Jesus is a masterful teacher. The first are illustrations of two types of roads and gates. Now remember, what has Jesus been talking about prior to the sayings that we have now? He ends with what statement? Do you remember? Come on, folks. When I wake up, there's a coffee machine in my office. There's probably coffee in the kitchen if you want to go get some. You know what I'm talking about here? What did he say? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's what he says. Okay, so we're, we're in that spot now. Okay. He's used that as the, one of the final things he teaches that starts all the way back from you are blessed, you're, the people who aren't blessed are now blessed. The people, you know, if you're, if you're angry, there's a problem here. We've got to learn to love one another. I don't get angry because my kingdom has been violated. I, get, I, I don't get angry for whatever reason. So if I do have an anger issue, I have to deal with it. If I cultivate lust, that's actually coming out of anger. I don't care about you. I want to use you. You starting to follow this now? So Jesus just keeps going on. I want to manipulate you. I want to swear these oaths. Now he goes all the way through that, and then he says, do unto others. He even asks. He even says, okay, ask about a person. Don't condemn them. Try to find out from them what they need. How can you help them? That's asking another person. We're not condemning them. We just find out what the problem is. Now, you may, your response may actually be, you know, that's not too smart what you're doing. But we're talking about manipulating other people. We're talking about condemning people. Judge not so you won't be judged. He's talking about that as well. We're talking about taking condemnation out of our eye. And we do that. And now he gets to these illustrations. He starts with, okay, what about this, this golden rule that we know we do unto others? We love other people. That's the standard for us first, for folks. We love God and we love each other. Everybody with me? We trust God and we train. Now, the illustrations are two types of roads and gates. And so let's start with that one. Is it working? There we go. Enter by the narrow gate. Now, already we see something's going on here. What is it? How does Jesus describe the narrow gate? Let's watch. For the gate is wide and easy that leads to destruction. Not annihilation, destruction. Okay? So we already see something here. There's a narrow gate in the illustration, and there's a wide gate. Okay? So which one is good? Watch. Those who enter the wide gate are many. Now who is the primary audience that Matthew is that Jesus in Matthew's gospel is communicating with? Jews, but there's another implied audience. Pharisees, scribes and the Pharisees. Okay? So watch this. Now, I just want to remind you of something. Are scribes and Pharisees religious people? If you looked at their lives, would you say, hmm, 
They're really committed. Would you? Of course you would. They memorize scripture. They keep the laws. They tell us how to keep the laws. But Jesus, when Jesus shows up, he is saying that there are, there's a way to righteousness, there's a way to relationship, and there's a way to follow him. Now, enter the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, for those who enter it are many. Now, the positive side is, if you enter the narrow gate, you're going to have a positive response. If you enter the wide gate, it leads to destruction. It leads to non-life. You get this now? Jesus is telling us how to live in the kingdom. So there's a life and there's a non-life. Everybody follow me here? Okay. This is important for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to new life and those who find it are a few now how do we apply what does Jesus just finish saying before he transitions into these illustrations love others do unto others as they would have as you would have them do unto me to, to you so who is what's the foundational principle of a discipleship, of a disciple of Jesus. What? I'm not hearing it. Love. Didn't John say that a few years ago? I'm talking about the Beatles. See, five of you knew what I was talking about. <laughs> I'm a classic rock guy. All you need is... na 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 na. Okay. The, no, we're talking about the Apostle John, too. Apostle John recorded Jesus' words. What's the, w- w- there's new commandment I give unto you. And what is it? Love one another. I'm only giving you one. <laughs> there's only one. Okay, so the gate is narrow. So in the context here, what is the narrow gate? What is it? How am I going to conquer as a disciple of Jesus, beginning to reflect him, how am I going to conquer anger and lust and manipulative behavior? And how am I supposed to see you as a brother or sister in Christ? How am I going to get past all your junk? When we get together in meetings like this, how in the world am I supposed to love you Without you buying my list, without you looking, not poking my kingdom. How am I supposed to do that? What's the answer? I love you. Now, we talked about there's not unconditional. You can't love unconditional. When I talk about enablement, I don't enable you in your back. Well, I just love you. I'm going to let you do whatever you want. No. If you come to me and I ask, how can I help you? Then, guess what? If you tell me, well, here's the problem. Well, you're sleeping with your dad's wife. It's a big issue, bud. Well, I don't want to give that up. Well, you're giving up the church then. Because you're not loving her. I had a, one of my ministries... I had a um, worship leader that, and, and new to the church. Um, Ellen goes on a women's retreat. It's just like the first month. We're there. Well, I don't think we were even there yet. We were new. Goes, on, goes up in the Ozarks, has a women's retreat. And during the women's retreat, we learned that the worship leader has a relationship he's, which, who is, is divorced. There's another divorcee in the church and they have a relationship together which has become physical. Girlfriend comes to Ellen and tells her about it. Those are conversations you don't want to have. Right? <laughs> I 
Um, so I do. I sit down, I call the guy. He comes by early in the morning, works nights. He comes by to have breakfast with the new pastor, unaware of what we are about to talk about. And it was not a fun meeting. None of those meetings should be fun. But in the end, I had to say to him, I said, look, do you, do you love her? Yes, I love her. Why don't you marry her? Well, there's all this stuff going on. I said, you don't love her. You're just using her. It's a tough conversation to have. So we had to walk through why that was even happening. And you know what? It was amazing. God got in that relationship. They cho chose to be accountable. They, because they had stopped holding hands, you can never really stop, go back to not holding hands anymore. You know what I mean, what I'm saying? I'm using holding hands as a metaphor. You understand know what I'm saying? And they were later, I had the, I had the opportunity to marry them. But the issue was he didn't love her. The issue is he wanted to use her. Now, he may have had feelings for her. I'm sure he did. And we walked through some very intense counseling because they both were divorcees. They needed to understand how past relationships impact current relationships, that even in divorce, no, there's, there's two sides to every story. There's bad behavior on both sides. There's good behavior on both sides. You with me here? The gate is narrow of love and following Jesus. Now, quickly go through this. The second illustration is two types of trees and fruit. Now, watch. Now, beware. Now, how does he deal with this? Beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And in the context, who is he talking about? The scribes and the Pharisees. Now, when you look at the scribes and Pharisees, you're going to, wait a minute, they, they study Scripture, they memorize Scripture, they have all these degrees, they wear these funny clothes that show how righteous they are, they're out teaching us, they, they are legalists to, to the nth degree. But what does Jesus call that? You are ravenous wolves. I'm going to tell you something today, folks, this stuff still exists. You can go at, most, uh, at a lot of these crazy new church plants that are out there that are just coming, they're just going like crazy, and they're still practicing the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. It's just coming in a different form. And they will, they will tell you, oh, here's five, here's five ways not to lust. Or if they even talk about that. Because most of the time, their worship team is so scantily clad up there because they're entertaining people and they want your attention. Guys are going to pay attention. You follow me here? Now, beware of false prophets to come to you in sheep's clothing. Jesus calls them false prophets and he calls them ravenous wolves. But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. Jesus is the opposite of that, folks. Let me tell you something, if it sparkles and is big and there's no accountability and they never preach on sin or they never even talk about sin, you better run from it. Because the way, the way to that gate is wide. One of the things that, that Jeff didn't mention, which I'm sure he would have had he thought about it, but he left it for me about persecution is that the church did expand but it also decreased you know why some of them that went out from us were not with us to begin with so when you start talking about persecution guess what happens churches don't necessarily grow <laughs> They can shrink. They may spread. You may stomp a campfire out without water. What happens? Sparks go everywhere. <laughs> and little fires start that might become big fires. That's what happens during persecution. 
Beware of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing. Now he's given us who they are, what they look like. You will recognize them by their what? We are told that you'll recognize us by fruit too. What is it? Fruit of the Spirit. Did you ever look down at the next part of that passage at the fruit, quote unquote, it's called the works of the flesh? You ever look down there? If we focus on the fruit of the Spirit, all that stuff's great. But the fruit of the Spirit is actually like grapes. They come in bunches. You don't just have love as an apple. You have love as a grape. You don't have several apples lined up, different solid apples. You don't have a, um, an ambrosia apple, a Granny Smith apple, a yellow apple. You don't have them like that. But see, it's, it's like grapes. So when he talks, they're all grouped together. You have them all at the same time, more in abundance sometimes than others. But watch, you recognize them by their fruits. Grapes are grapes gathered from thorn bushes. Well, what's the answer? That's obvious. No. Or figs from thistles. Go look at the works of the fresh the flesh in Galatians. And what you will find is this is exactly what went on with the, the guys around them. They're so spiritual and righteous, they killed our Savior. They killed him. You see this? You can look good like a sheep, but inside you're a ravenous wolf. And this stuff hides within the church today. You have to watch it. Anytime you start falling into legalism, you start judging people, you try to be righteous by your own actions, this is what's going to come out. Please be careful with that. Please take time with Jesus. Please don't get prideful and fearful and makes you push in to conform to what you know anyway. We got to get the frames right. We got to get your vision corrected. If that's you, we need to pull them all this way. This is what Jesus is saying. Now, you're not going to get grapes, this is the illustration, or figs from thorn bushes or thistles, but a healthy tree bears good fruit. In the context, what's the good fruit? You look and act like Jesus in love. What is the ultimate symbol of love in, when we talk about Jesus? What? Sacrifice? What's that symbol? What, when we, if I say, I want I want a, I want a symbol, an illustration of who Jesus is, what symbol do we pick? It's the cross. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. So a healthy tree bears good fruit. I have to give my life away to you. You say, oh man, I don't want to hear that. I've got things to do. People to see. I got church on Sunday. I give God two hours a week. I mean, come on. I don't give him any more. You follow what I'm saying here? So healthy trees bear good fruit, but a diseased tree bears bad fruit. You guys know that. That's, these are just common illustrations from everyday life where people know you get worms in a tree. Nobody's taking care of the tree. Your fruit's not going to be good. Sometimes you don't even bear fruit, fruit at all. Tree is supposed to bear fruit, right? There's certain trees anyway. Nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. I think it's interesting that Jesus uses the word tree and he uses the illustration of the tree when the tree's what's in fruit is what got us in trouble in the first place. I don't care if it's, I don't, I don't think it was an apple. Might have been a pomegranate, who knows? Or it could be a fig that <laughs> was on the tree of life of good news. I have no idea. But do you see this? There's two different ways of going. Now, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? It leads to destruction. How is it destroyed? It's thrown in the fire. It's cut down, it's thrown in the fire. Why keep it around? It's not even a good shade tree. <laughs> okay. 
Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. What's the fruits of the scribes and the Pharisees ultimately going to be? We kill Jesus. In the book of Acts, we persecute them. Remember, there's a guy whose funny little name, he had a Saul of Tarsus, who later is changed to Paul and has a conversion and learns to love Jesus. How many times do you hear Paul say stuff like, I count everything I did, I've done. I want to press on. Now, here's the next one. Sandwiched between this, though, is some of the scariest verses in Scripture. Okay? Well, he's been illustrating about what? About following him and what that looks like. It's not easy. It's hard. And the primary, the primary group that's not following him is who? Scribes and the Pharisees. Watch. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, he's not talking about later and over there. Okay, when he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about the place you go where you die. He's talking about coming under the rule and reign of him now. Eternal life begins now by knowing who Jesus is and making a commitment to follow him as our teacher. He's a master teacher. You know this. We've said this repeatedly. So now we start to practice who Jesus is with you and you with me. And God's going to give us all gifts. We talked about that. Remember when we were meeting outside? He's going to give the church gifts for the purpose of growing us up into him. We are growing. We are training. We're not trying harder. Beating our heads up against the wall. What we're doing is we're learning to follow Jesus. And that just means, okay, I put my shoes on. I start to run. My, my, my heel hurts. John Gruden, he said, put your socks on correctly. Your heel won't have a blister. Okay? Now let me show you how to run. <laughs> I have this weird gait. You probably notice it's weird. I kind of like I'm, you know, not aware of it. My father, it's the same gait my father had. And my son has. It's the weirdest thing in the world. And you look at, his, you look at my, our shoes. There'll be one side of our shoe with the heel worn. You know, the other side's fine. You've got to buy shoes for one shoe. Or get them resold. I don't even, do they even do that anymore? You just, everything's disposable these days. My point is, it's how you run. Now, if I could correct it, I wouldn't wear the shoes out, right? I wouldn't have a sore foot. You, you starting to see what I'm saying here? Because you're following Jesus, there are going to be times that you can't correct it. Now, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, they're not doing that, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the what? Will of the Father who is in heaven. Now, let me ask you, what's the will of the Father in heaven? What? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. It's real simple. But it's real hard. <laughs> because sometimes I don't like you. Sometimes I have to go back to Jesus because I got angry. I got angry at my wife. I got angry at my wife and I got to go, Lord, why don't I get angry? What, what happened there? Let's go back and let's analyze this a little bit before ourselves. I have to learn to repent. You follow me? But repentance isn't just, oh, I'm so sorry. Repentance is turning around and going the other way. Don't get mad at your wife. Discover, train why you got mad and then go back at it again because you will fail. It's guaranteed. But listen, stop trying to manage your sin. You're going to fail every time. If you just sit around and go, oh, I, I just have this lust problem, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to close my eyes all the time. I'm going to look down at the ground. You know, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask that women are all covered up except for the pupils of their eyes so they can't make, they can't make me lust. What's that do for the woman? My gosh. 
You see this, and you know what I'm talking about. You see this in other religions. I can't. Oh, it's all, oh, I got. Oh, I can't. I might as well just put my eyes out. Remember, Jesus said that. Let me tell you something. If you're a guy, it don't matter if your eyes are put out. You stored enough images in your head. You know how you're going to get rid of that? <laughs> you got to go back to Jesus and go. Oh well, how, why? How did I? Why am I here? Why does this keep happening, Lord? Lord says, okay, I've, I dealt with the sin issue. So you don't have to come in here and just beat yourself up over the sin. What I want you to do is learn to walk without lust. If you start to see a woman, I'm picking on the guys today for some reason, but if, if, you, if you see a woman, you stop looking at her like, woo-hoo! What you start doing is, man, that's a, that's a beautiful creature. I, uh, man... God did a great job. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Now, some of you are yawning. You're squeezing it out your eyes. That's very good. I appreciate that. <coughs> I'm moving on. But look, these are dangerous scriptures. I want you to look at them. Lord, Lord, we enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Not everyone, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, does that not make you scared a little bit? Look at here. So, but only the one who does the will of the Father that's in heaven. Now, here's the last one. I went backwards, I think. <clears throat> On that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Pharisees and scribes were prophesying in Jesus' name. Or in God's name. Yes. Did they cast out demons? They exercised the power of Christ out demons. And they did mighty works in your name. Didn't we do that? And there are, are there churches around the country that do all kinds of stuff in Jesus' name? But I want you to watch this next verse. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. It's not that we didn't know him. It's not that those churches didn't know him. It's that he never knew us. There's a church down in Houston where my daughter lives. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people go to every week. And he teaches false. He's a false prophet. He writes books. They get sold at Walmart. He writes books with titles like Your Best Life Now. You know what? If this is your best life now, the only way this is your best life now, you're going to hell. I think John MacArthur said that. Well, didn't we build a big church in your name? Didn't we have a lot of people coming? Didn't I write books that sold millions of copies and I got my my bank account got big. I lived in a big house and we built this huge church and Went all over the world to spouting this stuff. I did television interviews. My, my name was household for a while. Well, well, Lord, when I stand before you, isn't that going to be enough? I never knew you. That's the problem. See, disciples are known by Jesus. Because that's a key thing. That's the word know, like I, Adam, knew his wife Eve. It's intimate I know Jesus. When I stand before him, I've never seen Jesus, folks. Never seen him. I don't think I'm going to have a problem picking him out. And the only way I get there is him. But the only way, I think I know something of his voice now. I think I know something of his presence now. I hope you do as well. I hope you're engaging in that. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, let me go one more. Lawlessness. These are teachers of the law. And they're lawless. Remember, they will twist the law to kill Jesus. Just when he, get, when he threatens them just enough. Now the last one, we get here. So the last illustration is two types of foundationers and builders now. 
everyone who hears my words. We might need to get this passage of Scripture and put it on a part of a wall in here too. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rains fell and the, wind, the floods came. The winds blew and built on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. We sing the old hymn, On Christ's solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Do we believe it? Do you believe who Jesus really is? Does your life matter? Does it... Does it is everything that you do in your life built upon that? Are you rearranging your life around his life and teaching? Are you casting out stuff, throwing it away that has nothing to do? I'm not wasting my time on that. It has nothing to do with me moving forward in Jesus. Are you going to be one of those Christians who is saved by the skin of his teeth? As jerked out by fire, as we were talking about a couple of weeks ago in Sunday school, when we are talking about the judgment seat of Christ, are you going to be one of those persons who meets a total stranger? Just because he saved you? And I'm going to tell you, I think God sets the bar pretty low. I really do in salvation. Discipleship is a different thing. Now, watch. There's, the, there's this last one because there's a, there's a negative too. There is a cost to non-discipleship, folks. And, not, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man, man who built his house on the sand. The rains fell, floods came, went same pattern. Winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. It was destroyed. Now, what's all that mean? <laughs> what have I been talking about? Well, what I said to you earlier is that Jesus is all about changing our vision, getting our frames to line up. He's changing who we are. Now, what does the world need? At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this. He said, you are the light of the world. Tell you what, let me tell you what Logan's Fort needs. Let me tell you about the family that's around you needs. The people that you influence around your life need. They need disciples who really believe what Jesus says and they rearrange their lives to do it. That's what the world needs. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to scare you to death. If you really try to do this, it's going to scare you to death. Because Jesus also said, rejoice when people persecute you. Say things about you. You remember that? Because he did it to me. When a disciple is fully trained, he will be like his master. Remember in Luke 6, Jesus said this. He says, why do you call me Lord when you don't do anything I tell you to do? I'm going to tell you something. That's the majority of the evangelical church in America. I don't know where you are. I'm still new here. I kind of got cheated out of a few months of being with you. Now, I'm not cheated. The Lord knows what he's doing. I trust him, right? And maybe that was all to kind of think through some of this, but listen. We don't want to have our ministries structured around legalistic practices. We're just doing it because we were told to do it. We look for a law. We do it as we train to be disciples. And the Holy Spirit, as we learn to hear his voice, we're going to now start to have our ministries that reflect that. Okay? We need to do it in worship. We need to do it in preaching. We need to do it in evangelism. We need to do it in outreach. We need to do it in service. We need to do it in in um, your personal lives. What Jesus is really after is a body of believers, all these parts doing all of that in this community. And there's no program. The program is discipleship. The program is following Jesus. 
oh, please hear me. Stop doing this stuff where you're going around. I just, I keep blowing it. I just keep trying harder. But you're still putting the sock on wrong. You're not listening to the master teacher. You're not getting the fundamentals down. The fundamentals, folks, are how we learn to live in this life. The sin issue is done. It's over with. You actually have the power to say no. Nancy Reagan resurrected from the dead here. Okay? Just say no. You have that power. You don't have to go beat yourself. You're sitting there going, I'm beating myself up because I blew it. No, go find out why you failed and then go after it again. That's repentance. I'm tired of this. I just, if we just do that, before long, people are going to go, oh, 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 wait a minute. Like it's some great new thing. They'll want to write a book. Start a ministry. You hear me? So let me ask you something. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Gates narrow. Fruit's good. But I guarantee you, if you really want a life that's well lived, if you want a life where you know you know that you know that you know <laughs> fulfilled purposeful then guess what Jesus is the way I am the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except by me let's pray Lord Jesus you're great you're glorious you're wonderful I pray today that you will use the words that have been said Lord, we want to live by this. We want to walk by this. We, need to, we want to be changed by you. Lord, we're scared. We're so used to being with you and we're so used to doing things our own way, though, that it scares us. Because it, it might mean we hurt. It might mean that we have pain. It might mean we have to give up something that we spent our life trying to build. It may mean we move away. It may mean we, that we have to go to a foreign country. It may mean that we have to do any number of things. Move away from our kids, our grandkids, whatever. I mean, it may mean something like that. But most of all, Lord, the hardest thing to do is just try to live this before our families. Sometimes, Lord, it just comes out of ignorance because we've never heard of it before. We've been good church members. I know I was a good church member. But being a good church member is not necessarily being a disciple. So, Lord, I ask that you move in the hearts and that you move in the minds and that you help people to understand. Don't you show them the changes that they need to make in your love so that you can help us love each other and other people. I don't want to do that. I'm not capable. I'm capable of doing it. I just need your abilities. I need you to help me. So show us, Lord, where we need help. Give us the courage to respond. If there's anyone here that doesn't know you, never made a commitment to following you, there's on a, they're on a path of destruction. They're on a path of non-life, a life filled with death. I pray today, Lord, that you would give them the grace and the knowledge to step out in faith and learn to walk with you. Hardly, there's many people in this room that can share their faith. Share them how to do it. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Would you stand up with me?